Uh, welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm guest hosting tonight, sitting in for Sandy. I am a horticulturalist and I'm a blogger as well, so you can find me at groundedandgrowing.co. And we are here tonight with a great cast of panelists and we are here to answer all your gardening questions. We're so happy to be out of the house this January <laughs> evening. <laughs> yeah, first, of, first in, uh, we're gonna go to Dr. Bob Skirvin. He's brought in some fruits for us. Hello, so I'm, I'm Bob Skirvin, a professor of horticulture that I retired, but I've been doing it 40 years. My specialty is fruit crops. So if you got, got a question about that, this is it. Now, one of the things I, I wanted to show you is that is, uh, every time I'm on here, I say I'd love to go to the grocery store and see what's in season, what sort of things are there and available. And right now, there's some interesting fruits that are coming in from the southern hemisphere. And there's blueberries. If you haven't seen the blueberries, are spectacular. We used to only be the good, good blueberries, pretty much when you picked them yourself at, <coughs> in the springtime. But now there's some really wonderful ones coming in from South America. There's big ones here. I, think, I, I don't know if you can see them or not. They're supposed to be shown to you. <laughs> and and they are big and beautiful and just they are really tasty and really good and they're, and they're really quite inexpensive. They're on sale at some of the grocery stores. They really got to do that. They're blackberries, they're raspberries that are on sale right now. They're really good and so get out there and get try some of these fresh fruits that are coming from from uh, various parts. These are from Mexico, but they're a lot of them from Chile and Argentina. They're coming in. They're very very high quality. Very very nice and not very expensive. Thanks, Bob. We've been eating our way through lots of berries at my house. My yeah. kids could eat them day and night, and it's oh, not yeah. enough. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, Marty, you've got a question from a viewer, don't you? I do. Uh, hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper, and when I catch berries on sale, they go right in the freezer. <laughs> I pull them out as I need them. Just, they're ready to go. Uh, a viewer writes that they had to cut down their 50-year-old honey locust trees because they died. What is a good shade tree to plant in replacement of them? I live in Champaign County. Also is the best time to plant in the fall or in the spring. Um, you can do either. Since we are in the middle of winter right now, mm -hmm. I'd recommend spring. <laughs> um, remember, you want to make sure you mulch that tree when you plant it and you want to make sure you water it regularly unless it's raining at least an inch a week. In that first year, it's important that that tree get enough water so it establishes its roots in the earth. It's like planting anything. Make sure you make the hole wider by maybe half than the ball or the pot that the tree comes in. Lots of loose soil around the outside because the tree roots have to establish themselves in the planet before winter. So help it do that all you can. And as to variety, pick one. I don't know if your house is tall or short. I don't know, so if you need a taller tree or a smaller tree or you're, you know, you had a shady patio that you'd like to redo, but you can do ornamentals. You can do uh, shade trees, ginkgo, oak, maple, uh, linden, more honey locust. I like sunburst myself because the new growth is yellow. It's very, very pretty. Um, all of these have uh, pros and cons depending on what you're looking for. Um, there's just a, anything that will grow in this region, feel free, do a little research and figure out what you'd like to have. And don't forget, if you have a big wide open palette, do some shade trees and do some smaller flowering things or maybe some fruit trees which flower and fruit. Great, thanks Marty, great tips. <coughs> okay, and uh, next we have Jim Schuster. Yeah, I'm Jim Schuster, I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist. And my first one was from Fayette County about a ginkgo tree that its leaves uh, curled up on Memorial Day weekend. Somebody told them it was a dead tree. Other ones said it was hit by lightning. Neither is true because when he wrote in August, the tree was still had green leaves. Uh, lightning, by the way, would have blown the tree to smithereens, or it would have run down the outside and fried the bark off in a lot of areas, mm -hmm. and that was not mentioned in the email, so I suspect, uh, for, oh, the other thing, ginkgos are pretty insect-free, and I do not know of any infectious disease that goes on in ginkgo. Mm -hmm. However, there are non-infectious problems, such as herbicide, which is I, what I think happened in this tree. I think somebody was spraying weed somewhere and you either had drift or 
in your own yard and you got too much and it soaked into the soil and got on the roots and it caused it to uh, curl up the leaves. Not enough to kill the tree, but enough to, and this coming spring, the leaves should all come out looking normal. Great, thank Unless you. we repeat the problem again. <laughs> Unless yeah. you're spraying incorrectly. Yeah. Right. Marty was talking about a possibly a new tree. I love the ginkgo, it's so pretty. And, and one of the things that I don't know if you ever notice or not, but in the fall when they, the leaves turn beautiful oh. yellow normally, yeah. and then, then pretty soon one day they just all drop off. It's just yeah. amazing watching yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. All I fall like it because it's a one rig tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah rig it once and it's done. It yeah. is a one rig tree. Yeah, I think within sure 24 hours year. of the first frost, they drop yeah. all their yeah. leaves. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Ash did that too. They just, they're beautiful and then they yeah. and they're, they're done. That's not like. White oak. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that may forever. factor into your shade oh, tree Oh my choices, land huh? sakes, yeah. it might, yes. <laughs> all right, well thanks for all that great information. <laughs> I actually have a uh, show and tell today. Uh, some of you might remember I was on um, back in December and I brought paper whites and I was talking about there's a way to stunt their growth mixing alcohol into the water to keep them short and stocky. And this is my experiment at home in my kitchen. The one on the left was watered just with plain water and you see it's kind of flopping over and you can't even see the flowers because they're off the screen. The ones on the right I watered with one part vodka to seven parts water and they stayed nice and short and I had a number of friends come over over the holidays and say that they looked like they were plastic, like they were fake. So. It, they were plastered. Yeah, they were plastered. <laughs> yeah. They weren't plastic. Alcohol your <laughs> growth, apparently. No, yes. so yeah, you may, de you may debate on the merits of using <laughs> vodka to water plants with. Get some cheap vodka if you ever, if that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <get> good <laughs> or you can use rubbing alcohol at a lesser extent. Rubbing alcohol is like one part rubbing alcohol to nine parts water. So at any rate, uh, <laughs> we're going to cut to the phone lines here, and we've got a caller from Decatur on line two, Karen. Yes. Hi. Hi. Here's my question. Sure. I've been reading articles on the internet about using cornmeal as a way to prevent weeds from germinating. And the idea is to, to, to sprinkle the cornmeal on the uh, ground. And I wondered if there was any truth to this article. Yeah, I'm try, I'm trying to think what it is. There's another name for it. It's not really cornmeal, but corn it's corn gluten. Gluten. Corn corn gluten. Okay. Corn you, gluten. You have to, in the processing of a, of a corn grain, then the, the part of it is extracted and it mm -hmm. works. And I remember back when we were doing a lot of work with strawberries, as the strawberries, they use that, they were trying to use that as organic herbicide, mm -hmm. put, put it around the strawberries to keep the weeds from growing. And it actually worked quite well. And I, I don't know where you buy it. Uh, I've seen it at you even can, the big box stores. You, you can know. also, yeah, you can buy it locally usually, or you can also order it online from gardening catalog companies um, if they don't carry it in your local garden center, I would ask them to. Mm. Um, but I do like to point yeah. out, unless it's got a herbicide label, that's not a legal recommendation from the U of I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, There you go. Read and follow directions, but um, it's worth a try. Yeah. Can't help my, can't hurt well, my there, help. There was a lot of work at, yeah. at one point, I was on a big, big national group, okay. and they were trying to try this material. I said, really worked with strawberries over in Iowa. They did a lot of work with over in Iowa. With the, with Probably the something yeah. you have to keep reapplying, I imagine. Yeah. It is, and the reason it works is because it's a super fertilizer, is what it does. The, oh. the weeds germinate, and the protein in that just, or the nitrogen, just makes them shoot up before they can form roots, and then they die because they don't have roots. But oh. again, you okay. have to keep reapplying it. Interesting. So, no. Interesting. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and do another round of questions, but remind the viewers, hey, call us. Uh, we're here to take your questions, 217-333-3495. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about pruning a little bit. Yeah. You were saying that this is yeah. a great time? Yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about, this time of year is absolutely perfect for pruning. If you, if you get outside, it's kind of cold, but you know, but it's still it's the right time of the year to get out and prune your fruit trees, prune your apple trees, the grapes. Uh, you have to be careful with blackberries and raspberries. It's a perfect time to do it. And you get out and with, uh, with the grapes, is right, right now you can see that the grapes flower on last year's wood and, and it'll be, I don't have pictures of it here, but it, it'll be a light brown shoots. That's probably what, and, and the old gray that's peeling off stuff, that, that has fruit. It's time to get rid of that material or at least some of it. And tie, tie your plants up. Okay. It's perfect for grapes, absolutely perfect to get out, to pr prune your grapes. The blackberries, you can prune those, but I always say with, with the thornless blackberries, you have to be really careful because the thornless blackberries die, die back from the tip. So they, some of the thornless blackberries have 15-foot canes, 
and if you go back and prune them right here, they, they will die from this point back. Mm -hmm. I've so, messed mine up that way, <laughs> yeah. so I just so, leave them. So <laughs> wait, wait, wait until later in the, yeah. you know, kind of the end of spring, yeah. then you can, you can see how much is dead. Right there, I was talking about the hydrangeas that we were talking about yeah. earlier, and cut, cut it back. Once you see the what's alive, what's dead. You kind of take stock of what's and what survived. And, and the nice <laughs> thing about the apples right now, you can see you can see the waters, the shoots are going straight up in the air. They're going to be a big problem. Take it's easy, easier to cut them out right now. You can see where they are. Later when the leaves are on the tree, it's so hard to get in and you know, you kind of, well, that looks oh, like sure. the right spot to cut. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, later yeah. in the year, we have so many other things to be worried yeah. about, too. So we're looking for yeah. something to do this yeah. time of year. Yeah, so it's a, it's a perfect time of the year to get out and, and, and do the routine. Oh, yeah. And, sure. and you can do evergreens, and you can do um, other shrubs. Don't do your roses. We were, we were talking about this before the show, like Bob mm -hmm. said. Don't do your roses or your hydrangeas yet. Let them break in the spring. And by break, I mean put a little bit of new growth on so you can see. Right. Where it's going to yeah, because they the, also the life, was dead, yeah. yeah they mm -hmm. also die back from the tips and then you know you don't want to cut off what's just wait till they break and then you know what's dead yeah. <laughs> and what isn't so and also where I live out in the country you have a lot of rabbits helping you prune your roses <laughs> mm -hmm. so typically I don't have to prune roses but I do have uh, clients <coughs> that, I, that have to do a little pruning on theirs so Great be, point. be careful about that. Great points. Did you have a, another email you wanted to share from I do. Viewer? I actually do. Um, let's see. An ongoing struggle. The saga continues. Yes. For this viewer, she was from here, but she's, uh, <laughs> she's, she, and she's very, very, she's a master gardener, but she's just having a time to destroy invasive and pervasive English ivy that her, my, her mother unwittingly introduced into a natural area around oh. their cottage. And it killed large trees because it's English ivy and world domination is its goal. So <laughs> when we get <laughs> mild weather in the winter, would it be effective to cut off the ivy at the base and dip the stems into tordon or some glyphosate? This darn ivy continues to creep back. She says this is how she killed off Japanese honeysuckle and autumn olive on the shores of the lake where they are this summer or maybe the river. Um, Yes, yes and yes. I find Tordon is very effective for stuff like that. I use Tordon a lot for woody things. I use it full strength. Um, when I'm doing hard to kill things like that that are woody growth, I cut them off as short as I can and I just paint the end right out of the bottle with this turn it blue. That's, I've never had anything sprout back out from that. And I'm talking about like mulberry and a in an evergreen hedge and you gotta crawl in there and get your eye poked out and it's like, you only wanna do that once. <laughs> so yeah, Tordon is very, very effective for fresh cuts. It's, I've, I think it's more effective than glyphosate, in my opinion. Okay. I've heard that before, so yeah. Oh. And if glyphosate doesn't work, try, some th try this Tordon. I've, I've had good luck with I've also used it as a spray, diluted, okay. um, like you would use uh, Roundup or a glyphosate product, but Mostly what I use Tordon for is, I, I try not to spray when I can help it, but for woody stuff, mm -hmm. there's just <laughs> nothing better. Cut it off flush and wave goodbye. It's awesome. Good information, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Jim, you had another question. Yeah, uh, this person has a peach tree, and they had called in and got answers about some leaves curling up in the spring, and that was peach leaf curl. But after that, they know it's bleeding on the trunk. Wow. And based on the pictures that were submitted, there's bleeding at the base of the tree, which indicates mm. bores. Mm. But if you look closely at one in the picture, there's bleeding near branches, which would indicate fungus, uh, probably cankers. And both of them can be fatal. Generally, if you get one, you get the other because they both like a stressed out tree. Uh, peach leaf curdle would have stressed it. Uh, it could also be old age because peach trees don't have a long life in Illinois. Mm -mm. And uh, so it gets about a 10, 12 years old. It's considered old for a peach. Yeah. And the cankers and borers come looking for it. Uh, you have to use an insecticide for the peach tree borer. There is nothing for the canker. So consider a new tree and cut this one down for firewood. <laughs> Good information. That kind of explains why we lost a peach tree yeah. at my house last year. It was right in that 10 to 12 year range. It doesn't take too long for peaches to come back in. in 
fruiting too. Two or three mm -hmm. years, you'll be back with a nice, right, yeah. a nice crop. So you're not going to starve. True. Right. True. Yeah. That when they produce, they produce well mm -hmm. in this part of the country. Okay, we're going to go to the phone lines. We've got a question from Jean in Athens. Hi. Hi, Jean. Is it time? Go ahead. Hi. Is it time to put nitrogen on asparagus? And if so, is the temperature right to do that this weekend? Man, I, I think it's getting off the morning. I would wait. I, I don't know about at your house, but there's still some snow on the ground at my house. Um, so it is a little early for that. I would I would wait a little while, but what does the panel think here? I don't know. I would I I'm not sure about that either. I would think probably not until March. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think March, yeah. April, depending yeah. on where mm. you're at in the right. state. Yeah. yeah. The plants aren't the plants are dormant. They won't now. do anything with yeah. it. Yeah. And if the uh. nitrogen goes down too, so it'll maybe leach away before they, it ever gets used. So. Right. Exactly. Good point. So mm -hmm. hold that uh, hold that thought and come back to it in a in a couple months. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go to line five, Teresa from or line two. Uh, sh uh, Jenny and Champagne. Hi, I bought a home um, about five years ago that had these huge, beautiful hydrangea bushes that bloomed pink and blue. Oh. And I'm on year five now. They were beautiful the first year and a half and they haven't bloomed since and I'm wondering what I might be able to do to stimulate the bloom again. Are you pruning them? No, I've been leaving them. That's good. That's very good. Don't prune Step them. One. Um, how large are they? Um, I would say they're about uh, four and a half feet by four and a half feet, so they're pretty good size. Okay, they were so really quite large and beautiful. Right. And the leaves haven't died, and they don't look like the leaves have any holes in them or no, anything. That, yeah, that wouldn't that wouldn't affect the the. I think <coughs> what you're up against is this is probably an older variety of of hydrangea, and they they bloom on old wood, like the wood from the year before. They don't bloom on the new growth that comes on in the spring, so the old wood dies back or freeze, the buds freeze in the old wood, and then you get lots of new growth in the summer, but no flowers. And that new growth in the summer is trying to put flowers on for the next year, right. but then it gets cold, and they don't, they don't flower <laughs> either then. Um, the pink and the blue are according to the, the pH of the soil. If the soil is a little more alkaline, it'll be pink. If the if it's more acid, then the flowers will be blue. If they're somewhere in the middle, it'll be kind of a lavender. Um, that you can affect. You can also try um, maybe putting some stakes around your shrubs and wrapping them or encircling them with burlap in the in the late fall and see if if you don't get any flowers this year, it's been quite cold. Um, if you don't get any flowers this year. You may look at um, trying to to protect them from the cold for the winter by wrapping them somehow. I'd, I'd wrap them around the outside and leave the top open. Um, you don't want to completely enclose them in a garbage bag or something, but you know, put a little fence around them, put some sure. some cardboard and some burlap, something like that. Um, keep the wind off of them. Um, if they're not blooming next this like this summer, I would really think about pulling them out and replacing mm -hmm. them with a newer variety. Good points. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just need to cut your losses and try something different. Yeah. 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 I mean, they're beautiful, but they, you grow them for flowers. Right. If you don't exactly. get flowers, it's like, well, dang. What's the point? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're going to go to line four. Deborah from Bloomington. You have a question on your beans. Hi, Deborah. Hello. What's your question? My question, I want to go pole beans this summer. Mm -hmm. I've never grown them before. Yeah. And I would be glad for any tips you have. And also, I'm interested in any companion plants that might be good to plant with them. You could always go for companion planting the old three sisters route, which would be planting squash along the ground, the uh, sweet corn, and then the pole beans grow up the sweet corn. Uh, it gets to be kind of a mess towards the end of the summer, but I've seen people <laughs> do it. And um, in theory, it all works very well together if you can tolerate the sort of mess that it ends up being. 
Uh, but otherwise, just um, get yourself some bamboo uh, poles and kind of do like three of them in a teepee shape and tie them at the top and plant at the base of each pole. Mm -hmm. And they should do the work let, for Let you. them climb. They, let yeah. them climb, yeah. Or if you've got any kind of a, a railing or Trellis, a anything. trellising. Yeah, just about anything, a fence. I grow mine on cattle panel or hog panel. Oh, perfect. It's galvanized. You put a couple stakes in the ground, put it on. They get quite tall. Mm -hmm. I mean, six feet, seven feet, it's not unusual at all. They'll get taller. Mine usually grow up and then they kind of fall down again. Love pole beans. So much easier to pick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just don't make the trellis too tall. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but, yeah, you just treat them like, like a bush bean any other kind. Of okay. It's fine. Thanks. Let's go to, back to the phones line five. Teresa has a question about walnut trees. Go ahead, Teresa. Hello. Uh, Hi. My husband and I have three mature uh, black walnut trees. And over the years, they've produced lots of nuts, which means lots of squirrels. Ah. And my husband wants to know, is there a way to prevent these trees from producing nuts? There, <laughs> there is, but it depends whether you want to spend the money every year, because there is a spray if you spray at exactly the right time. And, you, and she'd have to have somebody come do it, too. You, yeah. you can't, <laughs> you can't way do it up with, there. Yeah, yeah, you have to get the entire tree. The, and a walnut tree is probably pretty big if it's producing nuts. Yeah. And, and, and it's not going to be 100%. It no. will just reduce the amount. Right, right. And it's, it's so dependent on the timing, on getting it applied at just the right time. Um, I would save your money and get a good um, one of those picker-upper things to be picking up the walnuts and get rid of those and hopefully the squirrels will move uh, on. I thought you were going to suggest a good chainsaw. No, yeah. Me too. Me too. That's exactly I what I thought you were like going to say. I don't like the thought of cutting down a tree. Well, but I, had tr I had walnuts. I <laughs> did the chainsaw one. I got tired yeah. of the nuts hitting the roof and the squirrels one, eating uh, them. Oh, a one yeah. cut pruning job. Yep. Oh, yeah. I replaced them with some other trees that didn't make that much of a mess. Well, yeah. you guys will have to decide that. How much do you hate the squirrels? <laughs> and, you can, and you can sell the wood. I mean, keep the yeah. trunk intact. and You can even put it up. You know, somebody might do it for free because they wanted the wood. There you go. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so there's yeah. some options for you. Okay, we're going to we're going to switch gears here and uh, on line 6, Gina from Petersburg has a question on her pine tree. Go ahead, Gina. Hi, yes. I have a beautiful blue spruce that's 25 years oh. old. Oh, okay. And another Christmas tree in the yard that I planted from a seedling. And they're both beautiful, but they're losing their needles. And I'm distressed. What can I do to save these beautiful things? Are they losing the needles on the inside or from the whole branch from the bottom up, top down, whatever? Mm -hmm. From They started at the bottom and they're slowly creeping up. Yep. As soon as you said blue spruce, <laughs> we, all went, oh. we all said, yep, you got Cytos mechanicum, which is a fatal disease with enough time. The characteristic of that disease, most of the time it starts bottom up. Mm -hmm. It also can do top down, it can do north side around and the south side, and also does random death of branches throughout the tree. Uh, you can delay how soon you decide to get rid of that tree by keeping the bottom mm -hmm. branches pruned up until you get money and say, hey, all this, everything's up there at two and a half stories in the sky, yes. nothing down here, time to start over. And I would suggest something other than a spruce uh, if you do decide on the replacement. Uh, that disease of cytospic cancer tends to hit the spruce somewhere between 15 and 20 years of age and by the time it's 25 and 30 you're seeing the result. It is out of its native habitat which is the northern, uh, the, the upper reaches of the Rocky Mountain. Mm -hmm. It's basically the tree below Timberline. It does not like the climate of Illinois. Yeah. So this goes back to right plant for right place. Right. Uh, However, I have a blue fir mm -hmm. and it's not susceptible to that. Nope. So I mean, that's a, why it's such a different kind option. of tree. There's <laughs> an option for you. I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, line three, Steve has a question on Japanese beetles. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, uh, my name's Steve. I'm uh, becoming an Illinois Master Gardener through uh, the U of I Extension in Bloomington. Oh, yeah, here. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, good. But uh, I just want to ask the panel of experts, uh, what do you think that our cold temps are doing to the Japanese beetle population? Or do you think it will have an effect? Oh, I don't know. Are you a betting man? I mean, I I think that if we if we knew, we'd go play the lotto. But it's <coughs> probably going to slow them down. But what do you? I do you think, I just think there may be a slight reduction, but not very much. No, it's never going to eliminate them. No. 
Yeah, what, what really kills them if you get really good good frost. Get that yeah, 18, two or three feet deep, and we haven't gone that deep. No. It's been cold, but it's really the ground hasn't been. Not long enough. Right. We need yeah. cold for a long period. Yeah. We keep yeah. getting cold and then warming up, cold and then warming and, up. And the snow is acting as an insulator form, too. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. actually, yeah, that's true. Yeah, this has been a great evening for questions, surprisingly oh, yeah. so for January. We're all jumping at the at the bit here to get out in the <laughs> garden, and so get out there and get some pruning done. Uh, it's in some of those uh, little warm spells we get. And uh, we'll be uh, tuning in next time and save up your questions for then. So thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us this evening. <laughs>